Well, welcome everyone. We will give folks just a couple minutes to join. I see we have more attendees coming in. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Dine and Dash virtual lunch series brought to you by UGO and University Circle Incorporated. My name is Annie Pease, and I'm the Director of Transportation at UCI. The Dine and Dash lunch series will bring you a 45 minute virtual series on sustainable transportation topics. The sessions are being held once a month through August. For those new to UGO, UGO is all about sustainable transportation. We have a website called yougointhecircle.com that's the letters U-G-O in the circle.com with information you need about getting to and around University Circle on all different modes of transportation. During non-pandemic times, we host confident urban cycling classes, bike to work day events and shared mobility demonstrations in partnership with anchor institutions and community partners here in the circle. We also issue a monthly e-newsletter to keep people in the loop on local transportation projects, service changes, upcoming events, and other resources that are available to you all about transportation. The Dine and Dash series dives into different modes of sustainable transportation available in University Circle and Northeast Ohio. Each session features a professional with expertise in that topic area. We're doing short presentations followed by a moderated Q&A so those in live attendance can ask the presenters questions. We're also recording these sessions and they will all be made available at University Circle's website following each session. Before we get started and I introduce our speakers, uh, we have two items uh, in advance. At each Dine and Dash series, we have a raffle drawing. We're raffling off a $20 gift card to an uptown restaurant uh, of your choice, plus a $20 scooter credit. I have everyone who has registered for today's session uh, here in front of me and a drum roll, please. I am excited to announce that Megan Nodge is our raffle winner today. Megan, congratulations. We will be in touch by email to find out which restaurant you'd like your gift card for, uh, as well as your voucher for $20 worth of scooter riding credits. So today's session is all about biking. While there are many benefits of biking, both to individuals and to the community at large, we hear from many people about the barriers they experience to biking more frequently. Things like weather and knowing how to dress or what to bring when you bike, riding on the streets with traffic, do you ride on the sidewalk or ride in the streets with cars? These are the types of questions we hear a lot. Uh, and before I turn this presentation over to our guest speaker today, who's going to dive in on these topics in much more depth, uh, I have a few poll questions for the audience. Uh, on your screen uh, will appear our first poll question. So this is one where you can check uh, multiple boxes if you identify with multiple uh, answer choices here. It's how do you identify? Do you live in University Circle? Do you work in University Circle? Or none of the above, you're just interested in biking. We'll give people just a couple seconds to answer here and let's see the answers. All right, we have a majority here work in University Circle. Our next poll question, this one will turn towards bikes. Which of the following best describes your level of biking experience? And for this one, you can only select one answer choice. So you have, I haven't ridden since I was 11. I occasionally ride on trails. I ride around town, but I could improve or expert, you could probably host your own webinar on confident biking. Get those votes in. And here we go, I ride around town, but I could improve. I could improve, excellent. You're at the right session. We have another poll question. What's your level of confidence with riding a bike on the road in traffic? None, some, or a lot? Three choices here. A few more seconds to respond. And let's see the answers. 
None, okay. Uh, this is a pretty even split. None, some, and lots. All right. Great group here. Last poll question. And this one's um, more of a test, <laughs> right out the gate. Answers are anonymous, so answer honestly. Um, this is a statement. So bicyclists can always choose to ride in the center of the lane, regardless of traffic conditions. Is this statement true? Is this statement false? Or are you unsure whether this statement is true or false? You can think about it for a minute. Here we go. This statement is true. So we have 45% uh, indicated that statement's true, 18% false, and 36% unsure. Excellent. Thank you very much for your participation in the poll. Um, with that, I am going to let our guest expert speaker answer that last question throughout her session. Uh, and with no further ado, I'm going to introduce her. With us today to talk about confident urban cycling is Diana Hildebrand, founder of Diva D Cycling. Diana is an entrepreneur and cycling instructor certified by the League of American Bicyclists. She is a Shiro with Black Girls Do Bike Cleveland. Diana uh, organizes rides, one almost every day of the week. And you can read more about those rides and the different types of riders that they're targeting. Uh, and their locations all across Northeast Ohio, it's incredible, on Diana's website, divadcycling.com. I'm very happy to welcome Diana Hildebrand. Diana, you can join us here. And to the audience, we will have time after Diana's presentation for a moderated Q&A. So throughout Diana's presentation, if you have questions, enter those into the Q&A chat box. We will get to as many as we can in the amount of time we have left following Diana's presentation. Thank you to you all today for joining and Diana, take it away. Hello everybody. And I'm so excited to be here and talk about my favorite thing to do, biking. Like Annie said, um, I'm Diana Hildebrand. I am the founder of DVD Cycling, lead cycling instructor and member. And I also participate and volunteer for Bike Cleveland and Bike Pittsburgh as a commuter ride leader or as a cycling instructor. And of course, I am a proud Shiro of Black Girls Do Bike Cleveland, as I love to encourage women to have two fun on two wheels. So we're gonna get into the topic of um, getting started with cycling. And so I always like to go to the four R's, that is research, readiness, repetitiveness, and resources. So we're gonna jump off with your research. Um, Next, next slide, please. What type of riding will you be doing? That's a good question to ask yourself. Are you gonna be using it for transportation? Meaning your bike is your mode of transportation, 100% and or you're using it to you know, take care of business 75% of the time and you're using other modes of transportation to get back and forth such as buses um, or you can also use Lyft. Um, next thing is commuting. Commuting, commuting can be a few different things. Commuting could be from just running to the grocery store, going to work, um, commuting to a friend's house on the weekends, instead of you know taking your bike with you. Your bike is the most fun thing, most energy efficient, environment, environmental friendly mode of transportation you can have. So I truly encourage you all to start with the commuting aspect of it. Next up, are you riding for fitness? I ride for fitness, fun, transportation, and commuting. For fitness, there's a lot of things that you can do with cycling. Hill climbing, you know, um, changing your gears right on a straightaway. Try to figure out if that's what you want to do. Or are you just doing it for fun with your family, with your friends, just a few miles throughout the week? It really depends. So before you get started, you want to figure out what kind of riding do you want to do. Next up is figuring out what kind of bike you like or you will need for the type of riding that you're going to be doing, correct? So we have a few bikes that we can consider. We have road bikes, which is designed for speed. It's lightweight and work best on paved and smooth roads. Um, mostly you'll see like the drop bars or curved handlebars for a road bike. And it does give you an option to change your, your position or your posture. 
I like to tell people that with the road bike, because of the drop bars, you can, you know, move your body in several positions based off of that handlebar. Next up is a mountain bike. It's originally designed for riding um, off-road or on rugged terrain. It's also a great workout bike too because it's a little, it's a little bit heavier and it's gonna give you the workout that you need. The tread on the tires are heavier than on road tires and will work on softer surfaces, including unpaved ones. They hold up well for city riding. Though you may not go quite as fast on a road bike, but consider swapping out the tire for some less knobby tread to increase your speed. Next up, we have the hybrid. Um, hybrid bikes are a combination of road and mountain. I will also like to say that most city bikes are going to be considered a hybrid bike as well because the tire tread is, um, is for city riding. So it's a little bit thicker. It's going to be able to handle debris that may be on the road, debris that might be on the trail that you will be taking. So if you are new to cycling, I would suggest going for a hybrid bike first. And then as you graduate or as you ride often, you can graduate to a different kind of bike. Next, we have a touring bike in which I think is pretty cool because you can make any bike a touring bike. You would just have to add the accessories that you might need. And some accessories that you might need are a rack, front and rear rack. So you can place your items on there for a nice, fun, safe commute. And or you can wear a book bag, something that I love to wear. And plus, it's on a lightweight. I think it kind of gives me a little bit of weight. <laughs> Next slide. So while we're still getting started, while we're still getting our ready together, we need to think about the equipment that we're going to need. The first thing we're going to need is a bike and a helmet. You want to make sure that your helmet is sound. And I'm going to also say that it's not really good to get a used helmet because you don't know if there was an accident with that helmet or how old that helmet has been around. You will make you will also need water bottles, a saddle bag to hold your items, such as your fix it flat kit. Um, other extra items like cash or um, little snack packs or whatever you may need, that little saddlebag can hold a lot, even though it seems a little small. Like I stated in the previous slide for um, touring and or city cycling, you can have uh, panniers or a bike rack, which gives you a little bit more freedom off your body and it makes it more comfortable for you. It also can evenly distribute the weight that's on your bike and it helps you, you know, do a lot of things like grocery shopping. You can go and do sports by bike. There's a lot of things you can do on a bike once you have a bike ride, even cycle 100 miles. Next up, you want a bike lock because without a bike lock here in Northeast Ohio, if there's no lock on that bike, nine times out of 10 is going to get stolen. So make sure you go to your local bike shop and request a good, sufficient bike lock. On bike locks, they'll give you a number between one and four or one and six, and it'll let you know the level of protection that you'll have on that bike lock. Next, you wanna have gloves. Gloves is very important. Gloves can protect your hands. It also can protect you from sunburn. It can protect you if, you're fa if you fall from getting scrapes or anything on there. Gloves are very important. Plus it makes your ride comfortable. It gives you a little extra layer of protection against your handlebars. Next up is padded shorts. Everybody asks about being comfortable on a saddle. I truly believe in wearing padded shorts and you can also, for the ladies, get panty underwear, pant, I mean, I'm sorry, padded underwear. And for the men, you can get padded briefs. These items can go right underneath your clothing and it's a little discreet if you have to go somewhere while you have your cycling gear on under your clothes. A little extra items, and these are all weather-based. weather, weather based. It's base layers during the cold seasons. Waterproof items such as a rain jacket, waterproof shoe covers, gloves, and pants, and that's when you're riding in the rain. And maybe if you want to, instead of using just the standard flat pedals, which are the pedals that come with any standard bike, you can consider getting different types of shoes that can actually clip into your pedals and then also buy the pedals that are associated with those shoes. Next slide. So your saddlebag. The essentials. Your saddlebag is the most important thing that you're going to need to have a successful bike ride. What you're going to need in your saddlebag, we're going to go from the image from right to left. You're going to need a hand air pump or a CO2 cartridge. 
You also want to get tires and tubes that matches the size of your tires or your frame. A multi-tool, so you'll have accessibility for the little screws or bolts on your bike. Tire levers, so you can be able to take the, the tire off the rim and have a successful um, fix it flat moment. Also, with your fix it flat, you'll have a patch kit, glue, and a little sander. And we can always talk about that, and I do offer a class. I always say to the ladies, but also to the gents, make sure you have gloves because you don't want to get oily hands. While we're riding, a lot of dust get on our bikes, on our tires, and sometimes we don't want to get all that grit on us. So I always say bring gloves and also have some wet ones and hand sanitizer. You can find nice, affordable saddlebags at Walmart, Target. You can even find them at consignment places such as Ohio Bicycle Co-op. And also, you can also ask a friend if they might have an extra one. So it's time to get ready. We got everything that we needed. We did our research. It's time for us to know the basics. The basics are how to fix the flat and the ABC quick check. Before you start any type of bike ride, the first thing you want to do is check your bike to make sure that it's safe and sound. The first thing you want to do is check the air. That means either using the gauge on your air pump to check the air pressure. The air pressure will be located on your tire. It'll either say 40 to 80 PSI, or depending on if you have a road bike, between 80 and 120 PSI. Once you locate that, sometimes I tell people to circle it with the red ink pen so you'll know exactly where it's located. The next thing you want to do is check your brakes. You want to intermittently press on your brakes left and right and move your bike back and forth. Doing those will let you know if your brakes are working or not. And if your brakes are touching your handlebars, that means you need to take it to a shop because your brakes are not engaging. The next thing you wanna check your chains, your crank and your cogs. That's anything that's around your pedal system. You wanna check your pedals as well, making sure that there's nothing in the way or interfering with your fun times on two wheels. And the next thing you wanna do is check all quick releases. You wanna make sure that everything that's on your bike is locked, sound in place. So I'll say give your bike a little shake and if anything moves, just reinforce that and screw a bike nice and tight. The next thing is learn, learning how to fix a flat. Fix a, fixing a flat is, is a little scary, especially if you have to go towards that back wheel. We, a part of Black Rose Do Bike and me as a league cycling instructor, we offer sessions where you can learn how to fix a fat, flat as well as Bike Cleveland that offers these sessions as well. Um, you can find sessions on how to fix a flat on YouTube and or we have this beautiful uh, display on this on the page right now that shows you the steps from one to six on how to fix a flat. If you have any questions, feel free to email me and we can always work together to help you successfully fix the flat and get you going. The next thing for readiness is planning your ride. You want to plan your route. If you're gonna to go to work, See what the distance is. You want to time that out. The same thing for going to the store or just a fun ride with your friends because sometimes not everybody wants to ride long distances or only have a, a time frame for only 10 miles, maybe 20. So you want to plan your route effectively. If you know that there's going to, if you are not really a hill climber, do you want to find a route that's a little bit uh, flat that has low elevation, but we're here in Northeast Ohio. So there's going to be some type of climbing somewhere. You also want to check into what days or what time frame is safer for you based off of your confidence level. So, you know, high traffic time, people are ready to go to work. Most times people are, are zipping to get to work between the time frame of 8 and 10 o'clock. So if you don't feel comfortable riding in heavy traffic, then that means maybe you want to either go out and start your day a little bit earlier or wait till the traffic is a little slower for you at a later time. And or you can pick different days that might work for you. So you might wanna start off with just one day where you wanna to commute to work or do your type of activity. Also, um, you wanna scout your route. So take your car or grab a friend and scout the route that you wanna take for work. I will highly suggest scouting that route on the weekends and planning it around the time frame where you wanna leave. That'll let you know if you need to leave earlier or if you're right on track. 
Now, there are a tons of tools that help you route plan. You have Ride with GPS, you have Google Maps, you have Map My Ride, and so much more. Most mapping systems do come with um, a bicycle option. So once you get into that, that routing to your, um, your, your um, app that you're gonna be routing your ride with, you wanna make sure that it's for cycling or the terrain is for bike routes or for cycling or biking. I will be hosting a, an intro to um, route planning July 15th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, please register, which will be on the website, dvdcycling.com. It'll give you the tips and the tricks to route your first ride successfully. Or if you want to plan a fun activity with your friends, I'll show you the one-on-ones on how to successfully plan an awesome route for everyone. Now, I hear this all the time. And I even had somebody try to tell me that I needed to get off the road today, but I had to let them know there are laws for a cyclist here in Ohio. The, one that I did, the, the ones that I have listed here are the ones that I really wanna talk about because they're very important. We do have a three feet passing law. Give us three feet when you see a cyclist on the road. That means as a motorist, as a driver, you can pass the double yellow lines if it doesn't seem like you can't pass successfully with a group of cyclists or with a single cyclist being on the road. As a cyclist, you have the right to proceed through a red light if the light is not picking you up or not sensing that you are there because our bikes are a little light and there are some, um, some mechanisms that can identify if there is a vehicle at the light. Unfortunately, not all of them can identify cyclists. So the best option is you wanna make sure that you wait a full one to two light transitions. And if it's not picking you up, then you can successfully, successfully move forward through the light. Now, if a car does come, then you're fine and the car is gonna you know, activate the mechanism and then you can all move forward. Um, ride on a road except for closed access highways or freeways. We have the right to be on the road. We have The bike is our mode of transportation. It is a vehicle. We have the right to share the road with cars, trucks, buses, and other cyclists. So if there's anybody that says anything, please let them know that there is a code in place for us to be on the road. We are allowed to ride on the road, but you want to ride right as um, practicable, meaning you don't want to ride too far on the right where there's blasts, there's dips, there's potholes. You don't want to cause yourself to have an injury. So you want to ride right on the road where it's safe enough for you, but give a little room sometimes for vehicles to pass. I normally say three feet or arms length away from me on the right-hand side of where, you, where the sidewalk would be or where cars would be and then make sure that a vehicle can give you three feet on your left-hand side where you'd be on the side where cars are passing you. Um, and for our cyclists, we gotta make sure that we're riding two abreast. If there's a group of four, it's two by two. And at that point, we are a rolling big vehicle together. When we roll in, in a group of four, that means we are a car. In a group of two, that means we're riding together to keep each other safe. One nice little trip I want, tip that I wanna give everybody is that when you're riding with another person, it's okay to ride side by side, parallel to each other, but it's also really smart to ride a little bit, a little behind one another so cars don't run up right up against your back wheel. You wanna make sure to stagger a little bit so that vehicles can give a nice, you can give the vehicles a good visual distance between you and the other cyclist. So your bike, your vehicle, share the road, all right? This image shows you different options or different ways that you can maneuver as a cyclist on the road. You're gonna make sure you're gonna be riding smart at all times like you are in a vehicle. So we have buffered lanes for us in some areas. There are share roads and bike lanes located all throughout University Circle. And they're making some great, beautiful changes out there. So I advise every single one of y'all to ride because this is technically starting to connect communities. And then we have bike routes. You have those signs that are telling you, hey, you can take this route for biking. The next thing you need to do is be predictable, meaning there's no swerving. 
you want to let a motorist know that you're going to be passing left or right. You want to give a little quick little head nod, making sure that your head is on a swivel, letting them know that you're going. Before doing this presentation, I wanted to see that are these bullet points really working? So I went outside on my own and I did that. I, I gave a little quick, you know, letting them know I'm going to be moving. And then I put my hand out for signaling, left hand out for left, left turn, right hand out for right turn, put your hand back behind you for stopping and or slowing. Once again, ride as far as far right as, as safe as possible, but take the lanes when car cannot pass by you safely. Um, one thing, if there are any motorists in this uh, webinar, this is very important. If there is a cyclist on a single lane road, please give us space from the back, meaning you're gonna give us three feet full circumference. If you have the right to pass, make sure you are giving enough space for us cyclists to continue to ride safely and you have enough room to pass safely between us and other vehicles that may be approaching. And another thing, bikes are legal vehicles and should be treated as such per bike law 451101. And I love talking about this and I think this might be my next tattoo. <laughs> So repetitiveness, we need to repeat this process to become a confident cyclist. It's not gonna happen overnight. It may not happen in two weeks or two months, but it really depends on you. And I believe that practice does make perfect. So you're gonna be practicing riding in a lane position. As you see on this image, there is a share row. That share row means that you can take the whole lane. That share row means that cars can share the road with you. That means that's your lane and you can take it. Riding in traffic. You have to get comfortable with riding with traffic or in traffic if you're going to, to be commuting back and forth to work and you don't have a trail system near you. In that case, I will highly suggest riding with others or finding a ride buddy to get you a little bit comfortable. Bike Cleveland and other organizations do offer this as a, um, an option and you can actually hire somebody to ride with you a few times until you feel comfortable. They will also help you um, figure out your route and plan it out for you, meet you at the start and meet you at the finish. And ride often. To be able to effectively, effectively ride the way you wanna ride, you have to ride often. It doesn't matter if you're riding five miles a week or if you're riding 100 miles a week. You wanna ride often, you wanna ride and practice as much as possible before you get out there and do this on your own. Trust me, there's a lot of people who have been in your shoes as a beginner and a lot of us are willing to help you along the way. Now there's a lot of resources here in Northeast Ohio and in Cleveland and they're right around us all the time. Ohio Bicycle Co-op, Joy Machines, and Eddie Bike Shops are amazing bike shops, local bike shops for us. There are several other ones and you can definitely Google them and find them. Eddie's Bike Shop has four locations. You can go to eddies.com. They're great for bike fits, um, really good mechanical, like electronic issues. Joy Machines is an amazing local bike shop. They have great items and the mechanics and the staff are absolutely amazing. They're located at West 25th in Detroit. And then you have Ohio City Bicycle Co-op, which is an amazing location that has a lot of resources for everybody from beginners to experts. That have the equipment that you might need for your bike and the staffing is amazing and they offer amazing programming as well. Support and advocacy. You have me, Diana Hildebrand of Diva D Cycling. I offer tons of rides throughout the city of Cleveland, throughout Northeast Ohio, Ohio and Pennsylvania. I am here to support all cyclists of all riding levels and I love to help get people started and having fun on two wheels. You have Bike Cleveland, which is our educational and advocacy organization. They help, they help um, provide safer streets for us. They go lobby to politicians. They help create bike laws for us and they work with tons of organizations throughout Ohio and throughout the US to make it available, accessible for us to ride bikes on trails, on the road, and for pedestrians. Once again, you have Hugo in the circle. 
They are great. You can get all your information about the University Circle area as well as education and tips. You have the League of American Bicyclists, as I am a cycling instructor through them. They offer LCI training. They also provide you with information and statistics that you will need so you'll know how each state are going. And they also let you know how our city and our state is doing with cycling infrastructure. And then once again, you have Noaka who does a lot of great work in helping with the infrastructure from our trail systems to our roadways and multi-use pedestrian um, trails as well. So this is the end of the session and I know there's a lot of other topics we can talk about, but I would love to say thank you to Dine and Dash, Hugo and Hugo for giving me the opportunity to host this conversation as well as University Circle Inc. and Annie. We come a long way, girlfriend. I am so excited to be a member of the League of American Bicyclists as well as represent Bike Cleveland and Black Rose Do Bike Cleveland as well. And one final thing, Slow World Cleveland is coming back, y'all. <laughs> and I'm so excited. Um, Slow World Cleveland is one of the first organized and group rides that I joined four years ago when I lived in Middleburg Heights. And they have helped me become this amazing cyclist as they offer opportunities with Slow Roll. You can be a squad member, you can be SAG or SWEET. So if you're interested in supporting Slow Roll Cleveland, definitely reach out their website. I think it's slowrollcleveland.org or you can find them on Facebook. But I look forward to seeing everybody next Monday the 21st at North Family Greenway and we're about to have fun on two wheels. Diana, thank you so much. Wow, what an informative presentation that was packed full of really helpful tips uh, for people who are just getting started biking and even as a helpful refresher, if you've been biking for a while, um, this information remains valuable uh, at all different times. So um, Diana, thank you for mentioning Slow Roll. A special note that the Slow Roll coming up this next Monday takes off uh, from right here in University Circle. The meetup spot is on the Nord Family Greenway along MLK. Um, near the Cleveland Museum of Art, um, down by the Chinese Cultural Gardens. So um, see you there for those interested in joining a ride here soon, very local. Um, to all in attendance, please enter any questions you have into the Q&A chat box. We are monitoring those. And I'm gonna get started, Diana. We have about 15 minutes, a little bit less uh, for questions here. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in. And start with this one. Um, Diana, a lot of people have this idea that to get started with biking, um, it's really an expensive hobby <laughs> and that your bike's expensive, to have nice gear is expensive. Um, can you talk about, you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation, but could you talk a little bit about um, the cost of equipment and just kind of how, how people can overcome um, that barrier? And you're on mute. That is a great question. And cycling can be affordable. Like I said it before, we have Ohio City Bicycle Co-op, but also if you go to Facebook Marketplace or go to Eddie's Bike Shop, or um, you can also go to Joy Machines, they have some bikes that um, some previous owners argue, uh, want to sell or put under consignment. My very first road bike was $50 and my second one was just $150. And that's all because I went to Facebook Marketplace, did some research on what kind of bike that I wanted. Once I found the bike, I reached out to the person. You can also go to Ohio City Bicycle Co-op. They have a great selection of bikes available and the price point is not gonna run you no more than $300. When it comes to accessories, the same thing, going to the co-op, they have enough items available for you that you can start with your saddlebag, you can get your rack, you can get panniers and other items for your bike. It's very affordable and you don't have to break your pocket or the bank to get started. Excellent. Um, for those unfamiliar, the Ohio City Bike Co-op is located in the flats uh, down by Merwin's Wharf. So it's right here in the city. 
very accessible. Check their website for their hours. Um, but as Diana mentioned, you can get your, your bike, your refurbished bike, as well as used gear there um, as well. Um, Diana, we have a couple questions about slow roll, actually. Um, I'll start with one. Do kids participate in slow roll? Yes. So slow roll, you're riding no more than 10 miles. And you're riding at a pace between six and eight miles an hour. This is a family friendly bike ride. The only thing that we're suggesting is that your child um, should not really be riding on training wheels um, because this ride is on the road majority of the time. But like I stated, there are people to protect you. We're called squad. Um, we train for this. We train to keep everybody safe. And if you do bring your child, my biggest thing is to keep your child closest towards the sidewalk. Make sure that you and your family are forming a little bubble around them and that you're rolling at the same pace as the child. Now we do have SAG support. So if you're rolling a little slow, there's always gonna be somebody there to make sure that nobody's gonna be left behind. And we do take often, we do take um, breaks often so within that 10 mile bike ride, we're taking about three to four stops. Excellent. So would slow roll be a good ride for beginners? It is a very good ride for beginners. It's gonna teach you how to ride with groups. It's gonna teach you how to pace yourself on a bike ride. And then it gives you an opportunity to meet other people who are in the cycling community and who are new just like you. Awesome. Um, Diana, do you, with DVD cycling, do you work with adults who have no ability to ride a bike who are starting from, from zero? Yes. So um, on my website, there's an opportunity where you can uh, reach out to me to um, take confident cycling sessions. And we'll start from the very basics of how to get started with riding. So um, if you don't know how to ride a bike, and you're just getting started, I can help you get started. It's gonna, it's gonna take as much as you wanna give. So if you want it, come on, I'll give it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And um, in terms of bike type for someone who's brand new to biking, um, is a cruiser bike uh, a good style of bike for a beginner? It really depends on, it really depends on you. It really depends on what level of fitness you are as a beginner. Now, um, cruiser bikes are a little slower, almost close to where you want to, I want to say like a mountain bike, but a little bit slower. It's the ones that you'll, you know, normally ride on the trail. So it really depends on what type of cycling you're going to do. I would highly suggest um, a hybrid bike. A hybrid gives you the firmness of, a, of the tires is giving you more stability with the straight bars, depending on how you like to ride and how comfortable you are. But um, yeah, I think a hybrid is, is a much better bike for beginners. It's gonna give you everything that you need and you won't really have to upgrade, but you can always change out your tires. Thank you. Um, Diana, this session has been all about increasing confidence on, with biking. Um, could you talk a little bit about your journey with how you personally became such a confident cyclist? Um, so before, well, I, I always say this, cycling found me. Um, before cycling, I was an athlete. I played women's tackle football, but I incurred a lot of injuries from playing football, which actually took me out for the rest of my life. And I found cycling during physical therapy. When I moved here to Cleveland about four years ago, I was seeking an outlet um, and I was, you know, driving around my family and I seen all these cyclists. And then I was like, what is this thing? What is this lane? What is this thing on the road? So I did my research, right? And found out it was a bike lane and that Cleveland had a wide range of activities on two wheels. So before I even had a bike, <laughs> I'm so sorry, this is so great. Um, before I had a bike, I reached out to Black Girls Dubai Cleveland and they said that there was a bike ride and I started looking at all of the activities that were happening around um, Cleveland. 
and I was late to the to the game. I came in around September, October, so it was towards the end of the cycling season. Um, but I started off with going to Slow Roll. Slow Roll was my first group ride. Um, my first bike ride, <laughs> I did eight miles, but it took me two hours to do those eight miles. Don't ask me now how many miles I can do in two hours because it's way more than eight. Um, but I absolutely fell in love with it. But then what got me to this point of, you know, offering bike rides and helping people was that I noticed that there was a lack of education revolving around cycling as a beginner. And so when I noticed that there was, there was a lack of that, I was like, that's going to be my main focus. My main focus was to help others get there. But the only way I had to get there is I had to learn. So I made sure that I rode every single day. I increased my distance. I didn't increase my speed at the time, but I definitely increased my distance. I made sure that if I was going somewhere within my neighborhood, if it was 10 miles circumference around my house, I was gonna make it a goal to ride my bike to that location, do my business and come back home. That's the repetitiveness. I was ready, I did my research, I was repetitive. And so I was ready to get out there and ride those tips and of course having the resources so i reached out to black girls do bike and i found a group of amazing women to ride with and they also helped encourage me to do that so when you're starting off riding and finding that confidence having a friend or a group that can help you build that confidence is a major thing and you'll be shocked how far you can go with just that simple encouragement i would like i always say repetitive repeat, repeat, repeat. Once you get there, you'll be shocked how confident you'll be when you're riding on the road. Thank you. Thanks for sharing part of your own story there as well. Yeah. Uh, Diana, we have a person who is interested in attending the slow roll and is wondering how long does the ride take? You talked about the distance, but what about time? So the ride normally takes about two hours based off of the distance and the speed that we're going to be going, as well as how much time we take when, um, along the stops. So I'll say the ride starts at seven. We should be done around nine o'clock and sometimes we hang out afterwards. I hope to see you there. Excellent. Um, Dana, you talked about the importance of finding a safe um, a good lock and those different levels of security for your bike lock. Um, in terms of bike parking, what should people look for to find a safe bike parking spot? What's it, what's it do's and don'ts when you're finding something to lock your bike to? That is a great question. So um, most, most businesses have a bike rack right outside of their front door or along the curbside. Those are great because um, they're made for bikes. I, and if there's not a bike rack in front of a business, I'm taking my bike inside with me and I'm asking them, is there a bike rack available? And if there is not one, then my bike is coming with me. And let me just tell you, I have put my bike in a grocery cart, okay? If I can do it, anybody can do it. But um, I, there's different locks that you can use. Now you have the U locks that are a little bit heavier, but they're the safest and not hardly nobody's going to get take your bike once it's locked up. So depending on how the frame is of the um, your bike parking location, you can lock it up to the frame. I also, um, I wish I had it with me, those long cords, you can get a cord that's between four feet and three feet, four feet and six feet, and you can wrap that around your bike and lock your bike. I like those because I lock my tires all the way around the bike parking area, or um, you can use other tools. Um, a lot of people are starting to use the rubber kind of bike locks that you just can use the code. And those are absolutely amazing because you can have a few of them and you can lock your bike up in different locations. The, the how can I say this? The more secure your bike is, the less likely somebody's going to try to steal it. That's a good tip. Good framing. Um, well, that session went very fast, and we are right at the end of our time here. 
I want to thank all of the attendees who took 45 minutes out of your lunchtime to hop on and dine and dash with us. I especially want to thank Diana Hildebrand, who is here with Diva Decycling, um, to provide this great session. Um, thank you, Diana, for all your content. Um, to everyone attending, our next Dine and Dash session will be uh, July 28th, and we'll be talking about ride matching and uh, a new app available to help you find carpool partners. We'll also hear from an institution here in University Circle on the work they're doing to incentivize their employees to find uh, carpool matches. So with that, uh, thank you all, and we hope to see you at the next Dine and Dash. Thanks for joining us.